It's good to see all who are here tonight, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to present this topic. Uh, these books are not books for sale, as Glenn thought, or for, give, for giveaways, as GV started. But uh, this, whenever I study a topic of any kind, I go around my library and I just pull books off the shelf that I think can be of help. And some I end up using a lot and some I don't end up using so much. But I love having resources at my fingertips. And not all of these are books that you would recommend to anybody. But they can give us a perspective of, uh, of subjects as they are presented by other religions and most views about free will in books of this size are false. So if you know that going in, then you know what to expect whenever you go to a used bookstore and buy most books. But along the way, free will has been a topic that has entered into all of our lives largely without even mentioning it. It is something that we encounter when we talk to our friends and our neighbors about the church and many people in many religions do not even know that the religion they belong to does not believe in free will. They don't know that. They don't understand the concepts. So when we are talking to someone about these concepts, uh, we need to be very careful if when we have knowledge of something like this, that we say, oh, your church believes this. They, they may not and probably would not know this. Now here's where we're going to go. This is kind of an executive summary, if you will. Free will is an important concept in other topics other than religion. It's an important concept in philosophy and physics. And we're going to delve into that world for just a little bit. It is also a concept that the Bible does present. The, it does present the concept of free will for mankind and always has, whether in the garden, whether for Israel, or whether for us today. And it is false doctrine to teach otherwise. Now, understanding and application issues are something that I want to get to in our time together. Examining the statements of, I know God has a plan for me, and everything happens for a reason. So this is how something that was started decades, centuries ago, ends up having an effect upon our very lives and our very understandings of things today. And again, we may not even realize it. This is a subject about which there are ancient divisions. In August 28th of 1645, King Vladislav IV convened the Conference of Thorn, and he, sent, he tried to seek reunion between 26 Catholic, 28 Lutheran, and 24 Calvinist theologians, and they discussed things through November but it says no satisfying theological fusion was achieved. Well, 375 years later, there has been no satisfying theological fusion between such groups, nor will there be before the Lord returns. Free will is just one of the topics that divides those groups that met in 1645, and it continues to be a dividing topic today for many religions. However, replacing one set of false views with another set of false views is still false teaching. And that's what we find when we examine things like this, that neither Catholics, Lutherans, or Calvinists satisfactory to comply with the scriptures in all areas. Free will is not only a topic of division in religion, it is also a topic of great interest and great debate among philosophers, and we will discover this from a biblical standpoint as well. Philosophers attempt to find ultimate truth through their own reasoning. They do not want anything to do with God. They want to ignore God. They want to ignore the existence of God. They do not want to use the Bible at all as a guide. And so they seek by their own reasoning to come up with all kinds of truths. And they're trying to get to ultimate truth through their own mental capability and their own reasoning. It's a fascinating process. If you've ever read a book on philosophy or taken a class on that, as many of our students will in college, there are many who have taken uh, classes on philosophy of one kind or another. And these are usually godless classes. And that is intentionally so. This is just one small book. Fisher, Cain, Paraboom, and Vargas present their views on the subject of free will. And in that, they use terms like moral responsibility and determinism. 
These become very important words in the pursuit of the knowledge of philosophy as it refers to free will. And free will is presumed to be a kind of power or ability to make decisions of the sort for which one can be morally responsible. All right. Morally responsible is also defined and understood as being a type or status connected to judgments and or practices of moral praise or blame. Now they allow each culture to define what all of this means. Determinism is a very important word in all of this with philosophy because it's understood as the thesis that at any time the universe has exactly one possible future and only one possible future. Something is deterministic if there is no other choice, no other outcome available. Now, Philosophers thinking on the grand scale of things have thought this. If that is then true for the universe, what about the inhabitants of the universe? And if there's only one possible outcome for the universe, what about for us? And how far does that determined end go? Does it extend into every possible decision that we would make? Do we just think we have choices? Or do we really do have the freedom of choice? Am I a puppet and something or someone is pulling strings for my every decision? Indeed, my every decision, including whether or not I'll scratch my ear? Or do I have the freedom of choice to not scratch my ear if I don't want to? Well, all of this, if we were philosophers, could occupy us for the rest of our lives. And understand that such musings do occupy individuals of great intelligence over something no more important than whether or not I have the right to scratch my ear. Now, additional thoughts introduced in philosophy. There is the compatibility issue. Can we possibly have free will and exist in a universe that is deterministic? Everything's determined for the universe in the end, but can we have free will in the meantime? This is called the compatibility issue. So compatibilists think free will is compatible with the world being deterministic. Incompatibilists think free will is incompatible with the world being deterministic. Hard incompatibilism, libertarianism, on and on these views go. And in the, uh, in the work from the information philosopher, I found this very, very helpful. The problem of free will has been intimately connected with the problem and the question of moral responsibility. Most ancient thinkers on this problem were trying to show that we as humans do have control over our decisions, that our actions depend on us, and that they are not predetermined by fate, by arbitrary gods, by logical necessity, or by a natural causal determination. And so it is that we delve into this world and we see all kinds of things that are also sub-issues. Uh, causality. Causality is what happens to the balls when you strike them with, with the cue stick in pool. Uh, something has caused that to happen. So philosophers say that causality is the basis for all thought and knowledge of the external world. And the core idea of causality is closely related to the idea of determinism but we can have soft causality without strict determinism and an adequate determinism that, deter that accommodates indeterminism. And as Bertrand Russell has said, the law of causation, according to which later events can theoretically be predicted by means of earlier events, has often been held to be a priori, a necessity of thought, a category without which science would not be possible. Now, what have I just said? If this has happened, this will happen. If this has happened, this must happen. And when this happens, it is a fulfillment of what was required here. Because matter behaves in predictable ways. Now, philosophers have debated all of this and reasoned about this for centuries. So I'm going to show now a simple little chart that lets us know how they've done it. Isn't that amazing? Now, half the books that, are behind, that were behind me on that opening screen 
are about things like this. And I just found it fascinating. It's literally, as the old saying goes, much ado about nothing. It really is. And so, but this is a serious field of endeavor. And there are not just a few people. I quoted four people in the beginning. There are hundreds and thousands of people around the world who live for nothing more. However, we're not true. Because not only is free will in the world of philosophy and very important, it's also in the world of things like physics. Now for those of you that really understand physics, I'm sorry. I'm going to present a few things anyway. Physics is understood to be the science that deals with the structure of matter and the interactions between the fundamental constituents of the observable universe. And so it is involved with matter and its motion uh, and how it behaves in time. Aristotle and Plato actually delved into this world and they were attempting to understand the origin of all things, of course, and Aristotle ended up coining a phrase called the unmoved mover. Like how far will you go to avoid saying there has to be a higher power? And Could that be God? Could that be the God of the Bible? Well, throughout the centuries of time, individuals have debated this to no end. And Aristotle at least said, well, there has to be, in order for there to be time, there has to be something always in motion. It has to be eternal motion. And there has to then be an immaterial mover of that in order for that motion to be produced. And that, hence, that is the unmoved mover. He said these two items are minimally necessary, Aristotle argues, for there to always be change on, and for there to always be time. Now, let me throw a biblical concept in here that will hopefully give us relief along the way. Most of all of these highbrow things are easily explained by the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created. In four words, we have an explanation that satisfies all that these individuals are so desperately seeking. We come to our day and time, we enter the world of a fellow named Stephen Hawking who died in 2018. And he was an English theoretical physicist whose theory of exploding black holes drew upon both relativity theory and quantum mechanics. And he also worked with space-time singularities. You may have read all of his works. You may not. However, one of the last things that he did was produce a television show. And he attempted to make simple the com complex concepts of physics. One of his shows was about free will which I found very interesting. So he, he was very physically disabled and he had scripted all of this, some for him to present through his computer voice and some for the narrator to present on his behalf. And so Hawking said, looking back, I certainly made the choice to be a physicist and I certainly feel like I have free will because free will is what we call the complex physics that happens when we decide. So he's saying it's nothing more than the movement, action or reaction of matter. The narrator says, in short, the brain is responsible for not only the reality we perceive, but for our emotion and meaning too. Love and honor, right and wrong, are part of the universe we create in our minds, just as a table, a planet, or a galaxy. It's pretty remarkable to think that our brains, which are essentially a collection of particles working to the laws of physics, have this wonderful ability to not only perceive reality, but to give it meaning too. The meaning of life is what you choose it to be, Hawking says. Personally, I like to think that it is every one of us that gives meaning to the universe. We are, as cosmologist Carl Sagan once said, the universe contemplating itself. Hawking says meaning can only ever exist within the confines of the human mind and in this way the meaning of life is not somewhere out there but right between our ears. In many ways this makes us the lords of creation. Well, interestingly, whenever he says the meaning of life is what we choose it to be, he's ignoring the possibility of God. And that is very close to the well-reasoned nonsense that the Apostle Paul encountered whenever he was at Athens, if you recall, from Acts chapter 17. Now, in this particular account, we find Paul encountering the Stoics. 
And the Stoics were uh, among leading philosophers of the day, and they are actually given credit for the reasoning that led to uh, the first uh, determinism concepts. So these were cutting edge concepts in the days of the Stoics after they debated them for several hundred years and in the days of the Apostle Paul. So when he encounters these, these philosophers, he addressed them, addressing their main beliefs. He quoted from their scholars to show that what they believed was wrong. He corrected their errors and he pointed them in the direction of God's truths in Jesus Christ. And it's very interesting to lay side by side what Paul said with what the Stoics and Epicureans believed and see how quickly and artfully he just dismissed it. In negotiating terms, you might say he just wiped that off the table. He did not give them a chance to have credit of wisdom for what they were debating and discussing and what they believed. He says, I proclaim to you, the God you worship without knowing, God who made the world and everything in it. A simple sentence for us to read, something for us to understand in faith, totally against what the Stoics believe. But here Paul is saying, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. They were surrounded by idols. Paul also said, he gives to all life, breath, and all things. He also said, as humans, we're all alike. We've been made of one blood. Verse 26. Now this just devastated everything that those philosophers believed. Because typical of philosophers, this must cause this, which must cause this, which must cause this. This is predicted by this, which is predicted by this, which is predicted by this. And then Paul presented something about the resurrection from the dead. Now that is when they stopped him. That was just more than they could possibly imagine because nothing that they understood to cause this, which caused this, which caused this, which caused this, would result in a resurrection from being dead. This was just more than they could take. And so some mocked. Some said, we'll hear more about this later. Howbeit, some believed. So when Paul was among the philosophers, uh-oh, now what do I do? Here we go. Are we back? Yeah. When Paul was among the philosophers, um, he was... There we go. Okay. Now, let's move on from philosophers. Let's move on from physics. And the religious side, however, is much like the chaos that we've seen in the world of philosophy. A presumption is made for or against free will based on a supposed cause, which then becomes followed by an effect, which becomes the cause for another effect, and so on. Now, I will say that this is very parallel to what Catholicism has done with Mary. Now, at this time, in that world, in that religious world, Mary is considered a co-equal in heaven, the mother of all, uh, a mediator, and it's like you think, how did anybody get there? Well, you trace that back, all the way back, all the way back, all the way back. You end up having an issue that started with, I believe, hereditary total depravity. And so in this particular case, free will, as it is seen by most religions today, is based on a false view of hereditary total depravity. So this is a misunderstanding of such passages as Romans 5 verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. There are several areas where research can be done on this particular verse that's very, very interesting. Uh, Cottrell has a fascinating discussion of original sin and his introduction to this particular portion of his commentary. And he does present... He says, in my judgment, Paul's primary concern in, ch in chapter 5, verse 12, is with physical death. That view is supported by McKnight, and also Alan uh, Bonifay presents that view in his commentary as well. 
So what is being presented in Romans 5 verse 12, therefore by one man, uh, what entered into the world? Death, physical death. Now, Calvinists hang their hat on this, meaning that everyone inherits Adam's sin. And so that reasoning then would go on like this. That reasoning says that since everyone is born in sin, we have no hope of having the ability to receive God's grace in our salvation. Then we are hopelessly stuck, and we can't possibly do anything about that. Now this is where what we know has to be applied to what we don't know. And when someone challenges us with something like this, the more simple our answer, the better, I believe. And so when somebody says, well, all babies are born in sin, it's like, no. Why did Jesus then use them as examples of purity? Because that's what he did in Matthew 18 and verse 3. And so that reasoning cannot be correct because Jesus wasn't saying, unless you're a big sinner like this baby, you can't be in heaven. No, that's not what he's saying at all. Calvinists also support their false reasoning uh, with Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, which says, For by grace you've been saved through faith in that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so at issue there is what is the gift that is given. And so the gift that is given has to do with the salvation that is ours in Christ Jesus upon our obedience. And so this verse is not teaching, though, universal salvation, as Glenn Osborne writes, for all men. It is merely stating salvation by grace is offered to all men. If we interpret it incorrectly, we would presume that faith is the gift from God. And therefore, of course, it cannot be within our will to ever seek faith. However, the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So once again, we know how to respond to something like this when in such an argument is made before us. Now in the world of religion, we do have religious, religious determinists who just simply add to the confusion in all of this. And it goes something like this. Because God knows all things, past, present, and future, Therefore, he must cause all things right down to directing the smallest decisions in my life. If I do right, it means God has directed that. If I do wrong, it would mean God has directed that. God knows my final disposition. Therefore, he must control every step that leads to that conclusion. When we reason like that, we're placing God on our level rather than allowing God to remain on his and so we are not God. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. And that is not who we are. And we will never, with our reasoning, no matter how long we might try, will discover God's plan for salvation through our own intellect. And that's what Paul addressed with our brothers at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The Greeks seek after wisdom. They're not going to come upon God's plan that no flesh should glory in his presence. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 29. And so it is, whenever we look to see what the scriptures say about God, they tell us, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, Isaiah 55, nor are my ways, your ways, my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So when the Lord addressed Job, he said, shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Job chapter 40, verses 1 through 2. God asked Job some questions. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that an abundance of water may cover you? Can you send out lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the mind or who has given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds by wisdom? Or who can pour out the bottles of heaven when the dust hardens in clumps and the clouds cling together? Indeed, we cannot. And so it is that Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Well, the concept of will does exist in God and in man. Uh, Schaefer says that will is that faculty in a rational conscious being by which he has power to choose a course of action and continue in it. Choices is the concept of will. God's will is the standard with which to measure all that is esteemed right in motive, design, and execution. Man's highest end is realized when he conforms to God's will. Even Christ came not to do his own will, 
but only the will of the Father. There's nothing higher for, the, for man than to find and to do the will of God. And so there are multiple views on the will of man, one of them having to do with Calvinism, the other commonly called a view that is Arminian, and that has to do with the teachings of Jacobus Arminius. And he was an individual who lived in the 1500s, and he rejected Calvinism. And he rejected their doctrine of predestination. And his teachings influenced Methodism um, and continue to, to this day, he did view that God's sovereignty and man's free will are and can be compatible. Well, we find in the scriptures that God does have a will. God the Father has a will. That's what's referred to in Luke 22 when Jesus said, Not my will, but yours be done. The will of man is likewise acknowledged in scripture as indeed the will of the Holy Spirit. And so one particular passage, Daniel chapter 11 verse 3 says, A mighty king will arise and he will rule with great authority and do as he pleases. Now that's free will in action when someone can do as he or she pleases. So there are a couple of mentions of the, of the phrase free will in the scriptures. One in the New Testament, Philemon verse 14 and also Leviticus chapter 1 and verse 3, where again, these are, these are choices that someone can make. Now in the 1500s, there was a huge change in the concept, the understanding of the concept of free will. This has to do with the reformers of Martin Luther and John Calvin and Desiderius Erasmus. They were Catholics, each of them, and yet they were very troubled with a lot of the practices that were within these religions. And of the three, only Erasmus never left the Catholic Church. And the tipping point for Martin Luther has to do with indulgences. Now, the selling of an indulgence was the exchange of money uh, or service for the forgiveness of a number of sins or for the release of a loved one from purgatory. And you may think, what? What is this talking about? Well, if so-and-so passes away, the presumption was that they would end up in purgatory, this in-between place. And if you wanted them to get out of purgatory and go to the place of the redeemed, then pay up. Pay up. Or do up. Do some good work for which you are uh, told what to do. Well, this started before the Crusades, but it was popularized in 1095, 500 years before Luther, when Pope Urban II remitted all penance of persons who participated in the Crusades. Now, the Crusades was Catholicism and those nations that the Pope controlled fighting, fighting against the Muslims. That's what the Crusades were all about. So, if you were a Catholic, the Pope guaranteed if you go fight against the Muslims in these crusades, you've got a ticket to heaven. And you can also do anything you want as you're going to battle and you will be forgiven. Now you read about those crusades sometime. They were pretty bad. Just really, really horrible behavior on the part of so many. Well, later uh, indulgences were also offered to those who couldn't go on the crusades but were willing to pay money uh, contributions to the effort instead. So this is, uh, this is the history of indulgences and in Martin Luther's time there was a huge campaign to sell indulgences to raise money for the remodeling of St. Peter's Basilica. And for those who have been to Rome you may have toured this very place. And that's what was going on where Luther lived. And there were very convincing salespeople, priests, selling these indulgences. Luther's response was to come up with 95 challenges to Catholicism regarding indulgences. And in fact, the word indulgence is used some 45 times in his 95 theses. And he was just fed up. And so he wrote all of this and he put it on the church door, which is presumed to be kind of a community bulletin board. And it was duplicated and spread all over and it was very quickly seen by everyone, including the higher-ups within Catholicism. Here's an excerpt from these. 
They preach only human doctrines who say that as soon as the money clinks into the money chest, the soul flies out of purgatory. It is certain that when money clinks in the money chest, greed and avarice can be increased. But when the church intercedes, the result is in the hands of God alone. Remember, in the 1500s, you dared rebel against Catholicism. You could be burned at the stake. And that happened in the name of religion many, many times. And so as soon as things like this was done by Luther and others, they, they were really uh, in danger of losing their lives over their protests. Well, Luther then developed more thoughts on this particular matter. Uh, I would say he jumped from the firing pan into the fire because what he was attempting to say is that faith is the basis for salvation and not works, meaning those indulgences. But he went on from that to be more and more enthralled with faith alone, including adding a word to his translation of Romans chapter 3 and verse 28. And all of that eventually led to grace alone through faith alone, as is believed by many around the world. Now, there were three individuals that are active during this period of time, Luther and Calvin and Erasmus. There was a denial of free will in the cases of Luther and Calvin, and they found those scriptures that they could twist to mean that, and as a consequence, they believed man is predestined before his birth to eternal punishment or reward in such fashion that he can never have had any real free power over his own fate. Now Erasmus, who stayed in the Catholic Church, defended free will. And he and Luther had do, two different publications, one, uh, one for free will, as believed by Catholicism, and one against free will by Luther. Now Calvin then went even further. It says God's preordination is, if possible, even more fatal to free will. Man can perform no sort of good act unless necessitated to it by God's grace, which it is impossible for him to resist. And so it is that this was the great debate on free will that happened in the 1500s. Now quotes from Calvinists regarding free will include these. Free will is nonsense, Spurgeon. Free will is the invention of man instigated by the devil, Wilmoth. Free will makes man his own savior and his own God, Tom Ross. To affirm that man is a free moral agent is to deny that he is totally depraved, Pink. And so it is that you have all of these individuals taking a false concept and adding to it to create more false concepts. Now I mentioned the fellow before that did believe in free will and the sovereignty of God and that he had influenced those who were members of the Methodist Church in those days. I found this quote by Adam Clark, which he died in 1832, but various sayings of his were collected into a work, Christian Theology, by his friends and published in 1835. And so this is what he has to say about this. There has been much spoken against the doctrine of what is called free will by persons who seem not to have understood the term. Will is a free principle. Free will is absurd as bound will. If it is not will, it is not will if it be not free. And if it be bound, it is no will. Volition is essential to the being of the soul and to all rational and intellectual beings. This is the most essential discrimination between matter and spirit. Matter can have no choice. Spirit has. God uniformly treats man as a free agent. And on this principle, the whole of divine revelation is constructed, as is also the doctrine of future rewards and punishment. If a man be forced to believe, he believes not at all. It is the forcing power that believes, not the machine forced. If he be forced to obey, it is the forcing power that obeys. And he as a machine shows only the effect of this irresistible force. If a man be incapable of willing good and willing evil, he is incapable of being saved as a rational being. And if he acts only under an overwhelming compulsion, he is as incapable as being damned. In short, the doctor reduces him either to a punctum stands by which the vis inertia is incapable of being moved, but as acted upon by foreign influence, or as an intellectual being to non-entity. And at the end of this, he says, putting forth the hand, 
To receive the alms of a benevolent man can never be considered a purchase price for the bounty bestowed. Forever shall that word stand true in all its parts. Christ is the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. And so we have in the days of the reformers a rebellion against Catholicism and the development of new doctrine. And that new doctrine includes those who say man is so caught up in sin that he cannot, because of his inherited state, ever have any awareness of how to escape that sin. Therefore, God has to work some special miracle in his life in order for him to ever have salvation or further, God has chosen from the beginning of time who is saved and who's not. And regardless of whether anyone understands that or not, if you're saved, you're saved. And if you're lost, you're lost. And there's nothing you can do about it. Either way, you don't have any choice in the matter. Now, into this world come the time of the restorers. What did they want to do? Well, they wanted to speak where the Bible speaks. They wanted to be silent where the Bible is silent. They were, as a group, Calvinists. That's what they had always believed. That was the rule of the day for people like Thomas and Alexander Campbell, Barton W. Stone, Walter Scott, Raccoon John Smith. They believed in and practiced and debated about the confessions of faith that included the denial of free will. Now, the Westminster Confession of Faith was one of these, and an excerpt of that says that a man is unable by his own strength either to convert himself or to prepare himself for that conversion. Now, that is what these individuals that we know and think kindly toward believed, and this is what they had to overcome in order to restore New Testament Christianity. Now, there are many stories given in the Restoration Era books that are just fascinating to read about the journey that individuals took. A more modern version of that is A Muscle and a Shovel by Shank. But in the ancient days of the Restoration time, Barton W. Stone wrote about himself in about 1801. And he said, I at that time believed and taught that mankind were so totally depraved that they could do nothing acceptable to God till his spirit by some physical almighty and mysterious power had quickened, enlightened, and regenerated the heart and thus prepared the sinner to believe in Jesus for salvation. That's where he was. But he said, wearied with the works and doctrines of men and distrustful of their influence, I made my Bible my constant companion. I honestly, earnestly, and prayerfully sought for the truth, determined to buy it at a sacrifice of everything else. And from this state of perplexity, I was relieved by the precious word of God. And so he did, in constant, diligent searching, find the truths that God has written all that is necessary for individuals to believe about the Christ in Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John, and that believing you might have life in his name. And so early on, uh, Barton W. Stone writes these words, Let me speak when I shall be lying under the clods of the grave. Calvinism is among the heaviest clogs on Christianity in the world. It is a dark mountain between heaven and earth and amongst the most discouraging hindrances to sinners from seeking the kingdom of God and engenders bondage and gloominess in the saints. Its influence is felt throughout the whole Christian world, even where it is least suspected. Its first link is total depravity. And so it is the first link to depravity. Uh, the first link to darkness in the Christian world is still depravity as believed by so many religions. Well, the scriptures do speak. We do know that Adam and Eve had a choice. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. And it is generally agreed by most all that Adam and Eve did have free will. Although that is complicated by distorted views of God's foreknowledge and predestination. But what about after the garden? If we read where anyone had a choice after the garden to serve God, then we conclude that free will continued. And we see that in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20, where among the words it says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live. And so it is that God's chosen people, Israel, could choose individually whether or not to serve the Lord. 
In the New Testament times, we find so many whoever or whosoever will type statements. Matthew 10, 32, whoever confesses me, whoever does the will, Matthew 12, 50, Acts 2, 21, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him, Acts 10 and verse 35. And these are verses where who can be saved is not limited in any way. And all are given the choice. Now, one of the passages that is much misunderstood is Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. And this has to do with uh, uh, whether or not we are predestined to be saved or lost individually, or there is a system that allows salvation. And so when Alan comments on this, uh, he says that he was talking to salvation of a class of people, those who would choose of their own free will to believe in Christ, to repent of their sins, to confess their faith in Christ as God's Son, and to be immersed in water, baptized for the remission of their sins. God predestined the way of salvation. Specifically, He predestined that those He had foreknown or approved of beforehand by virtue of their free choice to be in Christ would be conformed to the image of His Son. Now, with all of that said, yes, we do have free will. However, there are limits. Uh, there are limits to our free will, and we need to understand that there are limits to that because God gives us free will, and um, yet He gives us some limits. We can't fly, we can't see heaven, we can't see hell. We can't see the Hadean realm. We cannot see God, the Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. We can't see the angels of God or Satan doing their work. We cannot create something out of nothing. We cannot travel through time or walk through walls. We cannot start or stop the rain. We cannot answer the questions that God asked Job. We cannot see ahead in time. We cannot accurately see the past. We cannot know anyone's heart. We cannot on our own forgive our own sins or those of anyone else. But we can, according to the Scriptures, work on our own salvation with fear and trembling. And we can know the will of the Lord, and we can decide whether or not to obey. Now, the reason we have free will is because God allows it. Our free will is a gift from God. And we are responsible for our own decisions within His will. And we cannot blame God for being the righteous judge of all mankind, Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 14. Now, I want to look rather hurriedly at a few examples of modern examples of the denial of free will. The first of these is, I know God has a plan for me. Now this is seen and heard so many times. Here are some nice plaques, nice sayings, nice images. Whenever you do not understand what's happening in your life, just close your eyes, take a deep breath and say, God, I know it is your plan, just help me through it. You may not see it at the time, but God knows what He's doing. It's not random. It's a part of His plan. Dare to trust Him, Joel Osteen says. You are where God wants you to be at this very moment. Every experience is part of His divine plan. Here's another. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. There's a verse that goes with that. But the problem is that verse is not for individuals. That verse is for Judah. It's for all of Judah. And in the contextual setting of Jeremiah 29, the verses 10 through 14, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, I fulfill you to my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you and so forth. This is to the nation of Judah, not to any one person. So when someone says, God has a plan for me, I think we can respond, yeah, it's the same plan He has for me. It's the same plan He has for everybody around the world. God is not willing that anyone should perish, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. He desires all men to be saved, 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. It's the same plan for all. So when someone says, God has a plan for me, what are they saying? I don't have any choice in that matter. I'm deterministic, and I have no choice other than to do what God had me to do. I know I ran into that wall. God has a plan for me. I know I hit my wife. God has a plan for me. I know I hurt my child. God has a plan for me. Huh. Doesn't ring so true 
when you take it to those places, does it? But when something happens to us in life, instead of saying, did any of my choices contribute to this? A lot of times we blame God. God has a plan for me. Another companion statement, everything happens for a reason. This presumes a deterministic checklist. There must be no other alternative for me than to experience what I'm experiencing since everything happens for a reason. So if this was a bad thing, that's what God wanted to happen in my life. And I'm sure God will use it for something better. Someday everything will make perfect sense. So for now, laugh at the confusion, smile through the tears, be strong and keep reminding yourself that everything happens for a reason. But perhaps the reason is you're stupid and make bad choices. Have you ever talked to anybody that's gone through three marriages and that ended badly and they want to get married for a fourth time? God has a plan for me. Everything happens for a reason. Don't get married again. You've already proven it doesn't work well for you. Oh, but God has, really? But that's what people think. And that is the evangelical tool today that we must find what God's will is so we can make the choice that he wants us to make of where to go to school, of what car to buy, of where to live, on and on and on and on. And it's a tur turmoil life for individuals seeking God's will. The fact is, life happens. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 11, time and chance happen to them all. Life happens. There is such a thing as being in a good place at a good time. You ever walked along and found a $5 bill or more or less? Ooh, right place, right time. God put that there. No, right place, right time. Did God put it there? We would not know. Understand that very, very clearly. The age of miracles has ceased. And when someone starts delving into these areas and say, God spoke to me, I heard somebody cough. That's a message from God. Oh, the dog barked. A car went by, it was red. I caught a fish. No. Time and chance happens to everyone. How do we make decisions? Well, we acknowledge God's will. Lord willing, James 4 teaches us. Yes, we're to pray about everything, including prayer for wisdom. And do we then expect a miracle? That ship has sailed. That time is no more. And there are 